The archives of the little town of Cagliari in Sardinia contain the account of an astonishing historical fact. One night at the end of April or the beginning of May 1720, about 20 days before the arrival at Marseille of the Grand Saint Antoine, a vessel whose landing coincided with the most amazing outbreak of the plague in that city's memory, Saint Remy's, the Viceroy of Sardinia, whose reduced monarchical responsibilities had perhaps sensitized him to the most pernicious of viruses, had a particularly afflicting dream. He saw himself infected by the plague he dreamed was ravaging the whole of his tiny state. Beneath such a scourge, all social forms disintegrate. Order collapses. He observes every infringement of morality, every psychological disaster. He hears his body fluids murmuring within him, torn, failing, in a dizzying collapse of tissue. His organs grow heavy and gradually turn to carbon. But is it too late to avert the scourge? Even destroyed, even annihilated, organically pulverized and consumed to his very marrow, he knows we do not die in our dreams that our will operates even in absurdity, even in the negation of possibility, even in the transmutation of the lies from which truth can be remade. He wakes up. All these rumors about the plague, these miasmas of a virus from the Orient, he will know how to keep them away now. The Grand Saint Antoine, a month out of Beirut, asks for permission to dock at Cagliari. The Viceroy replies with an insane order, an order considered irresponsible, absurd, idiotic, and despotic by the public and by his own staff. He hastily dispatches the pilot's boat and some men to the ship, which he presumes contaminated, with orders that the Grand Saint Antoine tack about immediately and make full sail away from the town under threat of being sunk by cannon shot. War against the plague. The autocrat was not going to waste any time. The particular strength of the influence which this dream exerted upon him should be remarked in passing, since it permitted him, in spite of the sarcasms of the crowd and the skepticism of his followers, to persevere in the ferocity of his orders trespassing because of it not only upon the rights of man but upon the simplest respect for human life and upon all sorts of national or international conventions which in the face of death are no longer relevant in any case the ship continued on its course landed at leghorn and entered the marseille roadstead where it was permitted to unload its cargo The harbor authorities of Marseille have not kept a record of what happened to its plague-ridden cargo. What became of its crew is more or less known. Those who did not die of the plague dispersed to, di to different countries. The Grand Saint Antoine did not bring the plague to Marseille. It was already there and at a point of particular recrudescence. But its centers had been successfully localized. The plague brought by the Grand Saint Antoine was the Oriental Plague, the original virus. And it is, a, it is from its approach and diffusion in the city that the particularly dreadful and widespread flaring up of the epidemic dates. This inspires certain thoughts. This plague, which seems to reactivate a virus, was of itself capable of inflicting equally virulent damage of all the crew, the captain alone did not catch the plague. Furthermore, it does not appear that the newly arrived victims had ever been in direct contact with the others, confined as they were to close quarters. The Grand Saint Antoine, which passes within shouting range of Cagliari in Sardinia, does not deposit the plague there, but the Viceroy gathers certain emanations from it in a dream, for it cannot be denied that between the Viceroy and the plague, a palpable communication, however subtle, was established. And it is too easy and explains nothing to limit the communication of such a disease to contagion by simple contact.
But these relations between San Remis and the plague, strong enough to liberate themselves as images in his dream, are all the same, not strong enough to infect him with the disease. In any case, the town of Cagliari, learning some time later that the ship turned from its shores by the despotic will of its viceroy, its miraculously enlightened viceroy, was at the source of the great epidemic of Marseille, recorded the fact into its archives, where it can be found today. The plague of 1720 in Marseille has yielded us the only so-called clinical descriptions of the scourge that we possess. Yet one wonders if the plague described by the Marseille doctors was indeed the same as that of 1347 in Florence, which produced the Decameron. History, sacred books, among them the Bible, certain old medical treatises describe externally all sorts of plagues concerning which they seem to have paid much less attention to morbid symptoms than to the demoralizing and prodigious effect produced on the victims' minds. They were probably right in doing so. For medicine would have considerable trouble establishing a basic difference between the virus of which Pericles died before Syracuse, supposing the word virus to be something other than a mere verbal convenience and that which manifests its presence in the plague described by Hippocrates, which recent medical treatises regard as a kind of pseudo-plague. According to these same treatises, the only authentic plague is the plague from Egypt, which rises from the cemeteries uncovered when the Nile recedes. The Bible and Herodotus both call attention to the lightning-like appearance of the plague, which in one night decimated the 180,000 men of the Assyrian army, thereby saving the Egyptian empire. If the fact is true, we should have to consider the scourge as the direct instrument or materialization of an intelligent force in close contact with what we call fatality. And this with or without the army of rats which that same night threw itself upon the Assyrian troops, whose leather armor and harness they gnawed to pieces in a few hours. The fact is comparable to the epidemic which broke out in 660 BC in the holy city of Mekau, Japan, on the occasion of a mere change of government. The plague of 1502 in Provence, which furnished Nostradamus his first opportunities to exercise his powers as a healer, coincided with the most profound political upheavals, downfalls or deaths of kings, disappearance and destruction of provinces, earthquakes, magnetic phenomena of all kinds, exoduses of Jews, which proceed or follow in the political or cosmic order, cataclysms and devastations whose effects those who provoke them are too stupid to foresee and not perverse enough actually to desire. Whatever may be the errors of historians or physicians concerning the plague, I believe we can agree upon the idea of a malady that would be a kind of psychic entity and would not be carried by a virus. If one wished to analyze closely all the facts of plague contagion that history or even memoirs provide us with, it would be difficult to isolate one actually verified instance of contagion by contact. And Boccaccio's example of swine that died from having sniffed the sheets in which plague victims had been wrapped scarcely suggests more than a kind of mysterious affinity between pig and the nature of the plague, which again would have to be very closely analyzed. Although there exists no concept of an actual morbid entity, there are some forms upon which the mind can provisionally agree as characterizing certain phenomena, and it seems that the mind can agree to a plague described in the following manner. Before the onset of any very marked physical or psychological discomfort, the body is covered with red spots, which the victim suddenly notices only when they turn blackish. The victim scarcely hesitates to become alarmed before his head begins to boil and to grow overpoweringly heavy and he collapses. Then he is seized by a terrible fatigue. The fatigue of a centralized magnetic suction of his molecules divided and drawn together toward their annihilation. His crazed bodily fluids unsettled and commingled 
seem to be flooding through his flesh. His gorge rises. The inside of his stomach seems as if it were trying to gush out between his teeth. His pulse, which at times slows down to a shadow of itself, a mere virtuality of a pulse, at others races after the boiling of the fever within, consonant with the streaming aberration of his mind, beating in hurried strokes like his heart, which grows intense, heavy, loud. His eyes, first inflamed, then glazed, his swollen, gasping tongue, first white, then red, then black, as if charred and split, Everything proclaims an unprecedented organic upheaval. Soon the body fluids, furrowed like the earth struck by lightning, like lava needed by subterranean forces, search for an outlet. The fieriest point is formed at the center of each spot. Around these points, the skin rises in blisters like air bubbles under the surface of lava, and these blisters are surrounded by circles of which the outermost, like Saturn's ring around the incandescent planet, indicates the extreme limit of a bubo. The body is furrowed with them. But just as volcanoes have their elected spots upon the earth, so bubos make their preferred appearances on the surface of the human body, around the anus and the armpits, in the precious places where the active glands faithfully perform their functions, the bubos appear. Wherever the organism discharges either its internal rottenness or, according to the case, its life. In most cases, a violent burning sensation localized in one spot indicates that the organism's life has lost nothing of its force and that a remission of the disease or even its cure is possible. Like silent rage, the most terrible plague is the one that does not reveal its symptoms. The corpse of a plague victim shows no lesions when opened. The gallbladder, which must filter the heavy and inert wastes of the organism, is full, swollen to bursting with a black, viscous fluid, so dense as to suggest a new form of matter altogether. The blood in the arteries and the veins is also black and viscous. The flesh is hard as stone. On the inner surfaces of the stomach membrane, innumerable spurts of blood seem to have appeared. Everything indicates a fundamental disorder in the secretions, but there is neither loss nor destruction of matter, as in leprosy or syphilis. The intestines themselves, which are the site of the bloodiest disorders of all, and in which substances attain an unheard of degree of putrefaction and petrifaction are not organically affected. The gallbladder from which the hardened pus must be, must be virtually torn, as in certain human sacrifices, with a sharp knife, a hard vitreous instrument of obsidian, the gallbladder is hypertrophied and cracked in places but intact, without any parts missing, without visible lesion, without loss of substance. In certain cases, however, the injured lungs and brain blacken and grow gangrenous. The softened and pitted lungs fall into chips of some unknown black substance. The brain melts, shrinks, granulates to a sort of coal-black dust. <laughs> 